The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. Um, our next uh, presentation, we go back to Professor Lowe's, and as was mentioned, she uh, is working specifically on one of these uh, buildings, I suppose. So I'll just turn it over again back to her. So uh, I'm not sure how much I'm actually working on this, but I know that Jacob, uh, the master student who is working with me and Professor Don Lehman, worked many, many hours on this. And this was really actually more uh, building driven than it was uh, ATC project driven. Sorry, CMAC. This came out of uh, the 2006 uh, Taiwanese earthquake. It was a magnitude 6.4 um, in the southwest corner of Taiwan. And uh, my colleague Don Lehman and others wrote a rapid proposal to NSF and went to Taiwan and collected uh, data for damaged buildings. And I don't know if Santiago is here. We were also lucky that it was possible to collect um, multiple sets of building drawings so you could actually do something with, uh, do these kinds of analyses. There was um, not, uh, there was um, significant damage to buildings um, in the um, Tanin, uh, city of Tanin and uh, the Nanhua province. Um, we saw damage to uh, reinforced concrete that looks like it's flexural damage where you've got low amounts of transverse reinforcement and crushing. Um, there was substantial shear damage where you see a lot of columns with diagonal cracking. Um, and in one case, there was actually a collapse as well. Actually, more than one, but um, this, this particular building uh, collapsed. We're specifically looking at the Nanwan district office, um, and we, we, Jacob, has done a number of different evaluations of it, um, an ASC tier one, um, using this ATC 78 uh, procedure, which is, a, will come out and be published soon. Um, so this is a preliminary site to, to do some evaluation of that. And then also ASC 41, both linear dynamic and nonlinear, and I'm gonna talk about those latter two. So as CMAX said, this is a three-story reinforced concrete office building. Um, it is moment, uh, the lateral load resisting system is a reinforced concrete frame. There's full height and partial height infill, and the gravity system is a slab beam column uh, gravity system. These show some pictures of it. So this is the, it'll be kind of important to look at it, but this is the plan view of the building. Here's the front of it, you're kind of looking at it up there on the left. Uh, here is the east side of it in the blue, and then up in this uh, northwest corner. Originally, we have a set of drawings. We're going through it. We're looking at pictures, and you know, it's very hard to look at two pictures. I think about a month into it, we realized, you know, there's actually a retrofit of the structure up in that corner that wasn't in the building. It's not well connected to the existing building, and we have left it out of our analyses, but it is there, and that's kind of what you're looking at in that uh, green picture. And when I say well connect, not well connected, there are exterior walls on the building that you're, on the outline you're seeing there, and then exterior walls on this retrofit, and then some uh, passageways between the two. This kind of shows you the framing system, all those little black uh, squares are columns. The circles around those black squares at the top are columns that were damaged on the first floor. And then you can see the layout of uh, beams on the, um, on the bottom uh, image. Uh, this shows the framing system um, in, the, uh, in those directions. Um, uh, I'm sorry, so these are elevations in those directions. You can see the partial height infill. Looking at images, we took that to be hollow clay tile. Um, so here's partial height infill um, in the green, the partial height infill in the blue, partial height in the red. And then if we look at the other elevations, you'll see that there's actually full height infill, and we took this based on the images again to be um, actually uh, masonry, and, and then some full height and partial height um, on the other framing system as well, or other frame. 
We did not have ground motions at the site. We have ground motions that are pretty close. You see one is about one and a half miles away. Um, others are further away. Uh, working with a geotechnical engineer, we he uh, recommended that we use these three motions as the motions that are most representative um, of the motion that could be expected at the site based on soil conditions and distance away. Um, you can see that they do have um, slightly different peak ground accelerations, and I think this pops through and shows that there's slightly different frequency content. The first one is kind of the middle one. The second one is a little bit uh, more, uh, more intensity, and then the last one is actually a little bit less intensity. This again shows the uh, damage to the structure. So all those circles are columns that saw shear cracking. You can see the cracking in, this, uh, in these images here. Um, this additional uh, column cracking and then oops, also some damage to uh, infill. This is this retrofit or uh, addition to the structure, but the damage to the polyclay tile is similar to what you see up there in the top left. Most of the columns just look like they have pretty traditional uh, shear damage. This one stood out in Jacob's mind because there's pretty substantial damage to that column, and yet these images of the interior look pristine. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of the building that we're looking at and the damage that it saw. So this is uh, some information about the Tier 1 evaluation. We built actually a number of models. Um, this is showing six in total. I'm only going to talk about uh, four of them. And there are three images that represent the four models. So the first model is a pure bare frame model. Um, there is language in ASC 41 that uh, infill that is not going to have significant, doesn't have significant strength, therefore doesn't contribute to the lateral resisting, resistance of the system doesn't need to be included in your model. So this is the bare frame model with no infill. Um, the second uh, column flexibility is based on ASCE 41 values. So you can see that we're using flexural stiffness of 0.3 EI gross. Um, Beams, uh, five. the slab is represented with, uh, sh with shell elements, so there's some slab flexibility. Um, joints are considered rigid. The next model is what we consider the uh, baseline model, assuming that the uh, infill is actually contributing to the responsive structure. And so this is using the ASCE 41 recommendation of sort of a, a beefed up column. So you've got infill in a column, and you basically squash the infill into the column. And the way that we did that was we just introduced a rigid end offset in our column where that infill is. So here's the infill, 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 infill. So that's how we're representing that uh, additional column stiffness associated with infill. And it produces a short column effect then, so you, because you only have flexural response in the column above that. This is our ASCE 41 plus model. It's representing the infill using some shell elements. Uh, this is probably not strictly ASCE 41 compliant, but we looked at it anyway. And then this is using uh, compression only trusses to represent the infill. And there is a reference in ASC 41 back to older documents, FEMA 356, that you can use these compression-only struts. And we've taken uh, the results of some recent uh, work to define the dimensions of the strut. And then we've said the struts act like really weak concrete in terms of their uh, nonlinear response. So bare frame, bare frame with beefed up columns, shell elements for the infill, struts for the infill. These are the three ground motions, and you can see the periods of these different uh, models. So here's our bare, bare frame model. It has a fundamental period of almost a second. These two models are the beef that column and the shell element, and they've got a period of about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 seconds. And those uh, compression-only struts have a lower uh, period. And you can see where that falls in these different ground motions. Applied loading is pretty standard. Um, these are the gravity loads specified by ASC 41. Um, we're not using uh, design spectra. We're obviously using the spectra from the actual motion and then um, the load combinations that are required below. 
There are two sets of acceptance criteria for this system. There are deformation controlled actions, which are moments in the columns. Um, and the way that one looks at that limit is based on M factors. And so essentially that can be thought of as sort of a displacement demand, um, ultimately. And the way that I'm going to present them is this limit, which is the maximum moment in the column divided by MN at expected, which is a, uh, essentially a M factor that the building is actually experiencing over the allowable M factor from the ASCE one table. So if the limit goes over one, then you're over the allowable M factor. You can't use a linear elastic analysis. If it's under one, uh, you're good. The other action is a uh, force controlled action. It's shear. And this is essentially V max over uh, VN, again, with uh, lower bound strengths. Um, this is using the shear capacity equation on the bottom. Again, if you're over one, there's a shear failure. Essentially, if you're under one, you're OK. So these are plots of M, the ratio of M factors on the top and the ratio of shear capacities on the bottom. All the circled, uh, I keep looking at the right. Uh, these are for different symbols, are different models. Uh, here's our 1.0. So you can see that in the X direction, the long direction of the system, almost all of our models are showing shear demands over, uh, that exceed the shear capacity. You can see that there are M factors that are most of the M factors except for that. Uh, the X's are the uh, bare frames, so it's more flexible, the moment demands in that one are high. But essentially, shear failure, or failing this acceptance criteria or this limit, we're also failing that on the moment. Not so much in the Y direction, or at all in the Y direction. Um, and then this is looking at those same M factors plotted on the columns. So if you're in black, the ratio of M factors is over one, it's failed. Um, you can see that all the columns that fail in shear, that have shear damage, these circled ones certainly are the black. But unfortunately, there's a bunch of columns that are in the black that didn't see damage. And if you notice, the columns that are damaged are primarily along here, and there are many fewer that are up, that are up here, and it's possible that that addition to the building was protecting those columns a bit, and that's why our model that doesn't include that is picking up more damage than the actual building saw. Unfortunately, we don't have any drawings for that, so there's not a lot we can do with it. Um, these are all the, the models that represent the infill. This is the bare frame model, and you can see with the bare frame model that we're not getting anywhere near as much damage. It's just much more flexible. The demands on it aren't as high because they're out in the tail of that spectrum. This is just looking at different ground motions. So here's ground motion number one. You can see that, again, mostly shear failures, uh, the ratio of M factors in excess of one. Ground motion number two, it's worse. That one had more demand. Ground motion number one, or three, it was lower demands, et cetera. So conclusions. Uh, bare frame model is probably too flex flexible to provide a reliable characterization of the response. You really do need those uh, infill in there. All models predict shear failure and uh, no significant improvement between the ASC 41 compliant model and the different variations that exceed the code provision. So whether you have a beefed up model with that, or beefed up column with a rigid end zone to represent the infill, shell elements to represent the infill, struts to represent the infill, you basically get about the same response. Which is nice because the rigid offset on the column is just a heck of a lot easier. How much, uh, how much time do I have left? Three minutes, okay. We did a nonlinear tier one analysis. We used very similar models, a bare frame, rigid offset, strut. I'm not gonna go through and talk about how we did that. This is kind of what the column model looks like. Uh, here is a rigid offset or where the strut would come in. If we have struts coming in, we still have an elastic portion of the column. Here is a force-based beam column element. It has a fiber section down here. It has elastic sections in the middle, fiber section at the top, so this can represent nonlinear flexural response. And then at the top, there is a shear hinge. And the shear hinge is going to represent shear failure. This is what our shear hinge looked like. 
We also used a slightly more sophisticated shear hinge, but uh, I, don't, I don't have time to talk about the details of that one. So we just have a shear hinge. It's elastic up to the shear capacity. It deteriorates cycles within that. Nonlinear struts, they represent the nonlinear response of the, of the column in compression. Three different ground motions. Uh, and applied loading doesn't, that's not particularly interesting. Acceptance criteria. Acceptance criteria for the deformation controlled actions is another limit where we're talking about the curvature times the hinge length divided by the B value from ASC 41. So that's giving us, again, when it's uh, less than one, this has not reached the B limit over there and it hasn't collapsed. If it's uh, greater than one, then essentially you're at the collapse point. Force controlled, again, shear demand over shear capacity. These are really cool. These are movies that come out of our analysis. If you look carefully, you can see that the first four columns in the first floor are showing a shear failure, which is just that offset because the shear strength is, has failed. So the ASC compliant model, the compliant model with uh, rigid offsets, and then Oh, these are all the compliant model, I'm sorry. So these are just the different ground motions. So this is kind of what that looks like in terms of load versus displacement. Uh, the orange is the first story, and so if we're looking at base shear versus drift, for each of the different stories, the first story is failing, and that's what we saw in those movies where you get that little offset. We went through and did that for different ground motions and for different configurations and kind of got the same uh, set of plots where we're looking at uh, whether or not we've reached that B limit for <coughs> columns and, uh, that were damaged. And given a somewhat limited amount of time, I'm going to, oops. So, um, there doesn't, I think the, the interesting thing is that, um, again, we're getting almost no difference between the ASC 41 compliant model with that rigid uh, end at the column and those other provisions. Um, the failure pattern that we're seeing is not really consistent with the observed damage. Um, again, we're getting essentially what all of the columns showing damage, whereas in the real building there was much less damage in the northwest corner, probably associated with that addition. So we aren't able to pick that up. Um, and there are some limitations that we found that are sort of intrinsic to this hysteretic shear model in that you are, um, you can't change the you're limited with this with the simple model that we're using to here's your shear capacity. It's not a function of deformation demand. It's not a function of axial load. And so the next round of modeling will improve that shear model. So that gives you an idea of where we are with that. Um, at this point, uh, it's not bad. Um, it's perhaps not quite as good as we would like. And we're excited to introduce this improved shear model into the Thank you.